Well, hello, men of Prince George Winya. Uh, thank you for joining me for our second digital version of men's Bible study. We are going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to 2 Kings chapter 4, simply the next chapter in the book that we're studying. Um, and as we turn to the Word, I pray um, that the Lord will speak to us. And so in that vein, would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So, 2 Kings chapter 4. Elisha, who has recently taken over for Elijah as the main prophet, the lead prophet of Yahweh, um, has... Uh, proven himself in a sense in front of a lot of different audiences in front of kings and the sons of the prophets the band of prophets that he leads um, in front of uh, noble people and regular people and now uh, Elisha is about to go on a bit of a miracle binge this chapter is kind of uh, chock full of four or five depending on how you count the miracle stories remember that Elisha prayed for a double portion of the spirit that Elijah had and he ends up excuse me performing um, a double the amount of miracles, at least recorded miracles, miracle stories, and we get four or five uh, of them in this check in this section in this chapter. Um, and so we begin with uh, Elisha and the widow's oil, one of his more well-known miracles. So verse one. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, "Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children." To be his slave. So here sets up the problem um, of the story. Uh, one of the sons of the prophets, this woman was married to a member of the band of prophets that Elisha leads, and so it, it's likely that she is it's some, at least somewhat familiar to Elisha. Um, she says, the creditor has come to take my sons and to sell them into slavery in order to pay her debts. Financial indebtedness in the ancient world was fairly common. It was also fairly common. Uh, one of the ways that you could pay off your debts or make your debts right was to sell yourself or your children or your nearest relatives um, in your household, if you had uh, control of the household, into slavery to uh, take time to pay off the debt. Um, it was an unfortunate way of doing it, only for the most destitute and the poorest. Um, in the Mosaic Covenant that was allowed, you were allowed to, uh, Hebrews were allowed to take other Hebrews as slaves, but there were specific limits placed on the institution, um, specifically that you could only own another Hebrew slave um, for six years, and then the seventh year he had to be set free. Um, and so this woman is kind of at the end of her rope. She's at the end of um, her uh, financial situation uh, is dire. She's in dire straits. And so she goes to Elisha, the prophet of the Lord, for help. So verse 2, Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Uh, Elisha says, what, what can I work with? Let's see if there's a way that we can get out of this. Um, and she has a jar of oil. Oil is a good um, and uh, an expensive commodity uh, in this time. It's used for all sorts of things, cooking, cosmetics, uh, lighting, um, and medicine. Um, and so she has a valuable thing, but she doesn't have apparently nearly enough of it. But Elisha thinks at least we can work with this. So he sets her up for a miracle. He said, go outside, verse 3, borrow vessels from all your neighbor, neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Notice he, he expects the miracle. And she is, um, in a sense, having to exercise faith that what he's telling her is going to uh, come to pass. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she does this, verse 5. She went in from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And she poured... And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. This is the famous story of uh, the miraculously multiplying oil. Um, uh, notice in verse 7, uh, Elisha tells her, go and sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. 
Um, God provides so lavishly for this woman that not only can she pay off her debts and save her sons from slavery, but they can live on the rest. They can um, live the rest of their lives, it seems, at least until the boys are of working age. Uh, they can live on what they sell. So um, not only is this a moment of God's provision, but it's kind of a, a, an overly rich, a lavish provision of God for this woman and her sons. Um, it's interesting that this is part of one of the, the stronger motifs in all of Scripture, that God has special attention, special care, special providence for the lowly and the destitute and the poor. Um, it's also a motif in Scripture that God's people, that is us, are supposed to have that same kind of compassion and care and love towards those who are most needy around us. And I'm sure in, in this time of um, kind of worldwide suffering, uh, that it is not hard to find someone that fits that description, uh, perhaps even in our own neighborhood. So um, Elisha and the woman's oil, and then the transition to a new story, another story, uh, in verse 8. One day Elisha went to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a table, a bed, a chair, and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in. Um, in this culture, hospitality towards strangers, but especially towards countrymen and especially towards family, hospitality towards them, providing for them when they come to visit or they need a place to stay, is a, an extremely um, valuable cultural value. Um, it is, it's one of the, the things that distinguishes this culture from many others, that hospitality was one of the main things that um, ancient people were expected to perform. Um, also, this gives us a little hint that Elisha is not um, being provided for in many other ways. The king does not remunerate Elisha for his services. So he's dependent on the kindness of God's people for provision. This woman goes beyond providing meals to build a private, comfortable lodging place for him, in a sense becoming a patron of his, a benefactor of his. Um, and so one day he's there and he tells his servant to call the woman before him and he wants to repay her. He wants to give back to her for her generosity and for her provision. Um, and it's interesting that she says, skipping a couple verses um, to verse 13, at the end of verse 13, she answers him. He asks, what can I do for you? I'll do whatever you want. I'll talk to the king. I'll uh, provide for you um, uh, in, in whatever way you ask of me. And she says, I dwell among my own people. Um, so she politely declines Elisha's offer of provision. I mean, she kind of implies um, that she has everything she needs. Her family is going to take care of her. She doesn't really need anything. What's interesting in the context of the story is that whatever, what's coming to her, she doesn't really think um, that she uh, could possibly gain. Um, so, uh, Elisha goes to his servant and wants to do something for her, asks him, what do you think we should do? And he says in verse 14, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Uh, not only is she barren, which is a social stigma. If you were a woman and you were unable to conceive and bear a child, it was a social stigma on you in this time. Um, you were kind of seen as, as the odd person out, looked down upon in many ways, ostracized from the greater life of the community, raising children together and whatnot. Um, and so it was a, um, a social stigma. But at the same time, she also faces the prospect of old age without any children to care for her or inherit the family estate. Um, so not only does she have the social stigma of not having a child, but it seems like she has no heir for all of that money, the wealth that she has to go to, to perpetuate the family name um, and to provide for her in her older age. Notice, right, she does not ask Elisha for a son when he asks her, what can I give to you? And so it seems like she doesn't believe that such a thing is possible. Uh, but in a great kind of parallel of Genesis 18 and Abraham and Sarah, that's exactly what he promises. So uh, verse 16, he says to her, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, kind of like Sarah did, oh no, my Lord, oh man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived and she bore a son about that time, the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. Um, again, notice uh, 
Um, as Elisha had said to her, the word of the Lord, the speaking of the prophet, is an important theme throughout um, these two books of First and Second Kings, and actually all throughout Scripture. As the prophet speaks from the Lord, so it will happen. The absolute trustworthiness of God's word is one of the major themes of these books, of the stories of the prophets, as we've seen. But it also plays an important role, a preparatory role, for the New Testament in seeing God's promises, his words, fulfilled in Jesus, and in seeing Jesus himself as a prophet, right? So if you're reading Jesus' stories as the fulfillment of God's promises, and as Jesus as kind of the, the height, the zenith of the prophets, all of this background of the utter trustworthiness and absolute firmness of God's word, um, it, it plays a major role in how we understand Jesus and his role when the New Testament comes around. Um, so much like Abraham and Sarah as well, her, uh, her joy of having a child is in some sense um, cut short, cut off, because the child actually dies. And not just, um, it, the text is clear, right, that he is dead, laying on his bed dead. So in verse 20 he dies, and he's laying down on the bed um, after he's taken up there by his mother. And his mother goes and says, I know what to do, I'm going to call Elisha. Uh, this is an interesting thing. Um, it, it seems like she indicates she has a bit of faith that Elisha can do something about this dire situation. She's not quite at the point of being uh, bitter against him, right? You, you promised me the son and you gave me the joy of his fulfillment of this word. Um, and then you took him away from me. She believes that Elisha can do something about his state. In verse um, 23, she, uh, in a sense, I mean... Uh, lies or conceals the truth at least from her husband when he asks why would you go to Elisha um, and she says the, the, so the woman apparently does not want to inform her husband perhaps desiring to spare him grief or fearing that he might deter her from going um, perhaps and I think this is the hint that uh, that we get here in this story perhaps she reasoned that if Elisha's God can bring life from a barren womb Right? If he can give a baby to someone who uh, was beyond baby bearing age, then he could bring back her son from the dead. And so she gets to Elisha, um, or Elisha's servant first, and Elisha's servant asks, is everything well? Are you well? Is your husband well? Is your child well? And she responds to the servant again, kind of concealing the truth. She says, um, all is well. She offers a, a polite reply, trusting only the prophet, trusting only Elisha, with the truth for her visit. Um, it's interesting how Elisha responds. So look at verse 27. When she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi, that is, Elisha's servant, came to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Elisha is kind of taken aback um, because prophets in similar circumstances in earlier stories in Israel's history are usually warned about what's going on. And I think here is where um, we get uh, one of the lessons from this chapter, and we'll get to that at the end. Um, but uh, Elisha doesn't know what's going on. He just knows that she needs him and that she's in distress. And so they have this back and forth. She says in verse 28, then, I, then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Here we get a hint of her um, just some of that anger, some of that bitterness maybe at her situation comes out. And that's understandable given what has happened. Verse 29, he says to a servant to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. The urgency is there. Normally it would be very offensive to not greet someone who greets you. Um, or to not greet a fellow traveler on the road, but this is an urgent situation. And so Gehazi runs off and does that. Verse 30, the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sign or sound of life. Therefore he returned to meet him and told him, The child has not awakened. Um, uh, so um, Elisha uh, finally reaches the child, um, and he performs expectantly, prayerfully, he performs a miracle of bringing him back from the dead. Verse 32, when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child laying dead on his bed. Notice the insistence, he's dead. He's not simply sleeping or injured. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. 
Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, and his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again, and walked once back and forth in the house, and went and stretched himself upon the child. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Uh, in answer to the prophet's earnest prayers, the Lord gives life to the boy through Elisha's body. Elisha's ministry again parallels Elijah, who did something similar in 1 Kings chapter 17. Notice that prayer is an essential part of this whole miracle story. Properly speaking, only God can perform miracles, even if he does choose to do so through humans. Through humans. Pro prayer is powerful because it entreats God, it asks God to act in ways that only he can. Verse 35, the child sneezes seven times, indicating that his breath, his life, his soul, in a sense, has returned. The number seven is also a symbol of completeness, and so he's restored to fullness of health and life. Uh, this is uh, one of the great resurrection stories in the Old Testament, one of the images, the preparatory images for Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. This idea that God can do uh, the impossible and bring the dead back to life, and only God can do that, only a person um, who is a prophet, who is directly connected to God and his spirit, his power, can do something so miraculous. Nothing is greater, in a sense, um, than the miracle of bringing someone back from the dead. And so this miracle, this resurrection, prepares us for the great miracle, the epic resurrection that's coming with Jesus and with his death and resurrection. And so that's, uh, that's the main story, that's the main miracle in this chapter. But then we get two more, both focused on provision for God's people. Um, so there's a famine in the land. Both, uh, both of these stories are set in the context of a famine. Um, and so in verse 38, Elisha came again to Gilgal where there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, Set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. In Elijah's day, the Lord demonstrated his superiority over Baal by withholding rain from the land and from the nation, but by providing for his own people in the midst of that famine. Elisha continues this ministry of provision during a time of famine by healing a poison pot of stew. And the next story is the similar kind of story. Um, God provides for his people even in the midst of destitution and famine. So verse 39, one of them went into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. And they poured out some for the men to eat, but while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. He said, Then bring flour, and he threw it into the pot and said, Pour out some for the men that they may eat, and there was no harm in the pot. In desperate times, the company of prophets ate an herb with potentially fatal consequences, and Elisha's curing of this stew recalls his healing of the bad water at the beginning of his ministry in 2 Kings chapter 2 and reflects the Lord's recurring provision for his prophets. Remember, the Lord always takes care of his people. Even in the midst of famine, of destitution, of poverty, the Lord is faithful to his people. And then we end this chapter with um, a great little story that's uh, very resonant with some New Testament stories, some New Testament passages. We'll see that in a moment. A man from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give it to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can we set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he said it before them, and they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. In the context of a book, First and Second Kings, um, a book about covenant faithfulness, a famine should be understood as divine judgment, particularly in an era characterized by apostate kings. While covenant curses on the land afflicted the Lord's servants, the Lord brought relief through his prophet Elisha. And here's the parallel we see with the New Testament. Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 parallels Elisha's miracle in several ways, including the insufficient quantity of barley loaves. Lord, how are we going to feed these people with five loaves and two fish? A similar question to what Elisha's servant asks Elisha. The question of the servant, right? The disciples and the servant are in similar positions. They're under their rabbi, their teacher, um, and they're the ones that question his word. And then um, 
the presence of leftovers. Both of these stories have leftovers, uh, indicating an overabundance of provision in these cases. Jesus' miracle signifies that he's a prophet like Elisha. He is the prophet, the, the essence of the prophet, the height, the zenith of the prophetic ministry. And this is one of the parallels between the Old and New Testaments that prepares us for that image of Jesus. And then notice again, and a good place to end, um, all of this happened, quote, according to the word of the Lord. Once again, the Lord's word through his prophet is life-giving, in contrast to the famine conditions that result when uh, the nation runs after false gods. The word of the Lord brings life. Uh, and this is very important for um, kind of the preparation for Jesus as a prophet, and not only as a prophet, but as the word, as John 1 calls him. He's the very word of God, the word in flesh, the word in person. And so this image of Jesus being a prophet and also the word, the one who brings life, um, the background for uh, Jesus and preparation for him in these chapters are very significant to us coming to the New Testament and understanding how important of a figure Jesus is. Um, so getting back uh, to that lesson that we can learn, I think one of the lessons we can learn from this chapter it comes um, when Elisha says, the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Um, see, sometimes we don't know how the Lord is at work, but just because we don't know how he's at work in a particular situation doesn't mean that he's not at work. Um, I think uh, a situation like ours with the coronavirus, the lockdown, um, the isolation, um, we can be very confused. Lord, what are you doing here? We don't know what you're doing. We can't see you at work. And this passage teaches us, and I think similar passages in the New Testament um, and the life of Jesus himself can teach us that even though we don't know how God is at work, we can trust that he is. Even if we don't know how, he's going to work for our good and for his glory through something like the coronavirus. We can trust that he will do so, even if we don't know how. And I believe one day he'll show us. One day he'll show us how. Um, we can look back on our lives and on all of human history, I think, uh, personally. We'll be able to look back and see how God was at work and see his wisdom manifold and how he handled everything. But in the meantime, we have to trust that even though we don't see him at work in obvious ways or we don't know how he's at work, we can still trust that he is at work. I think the cross and resurrection of Jesus proves that most of all. So as we close, a couple of reflection questions for you to maybe um, uh, take some time to think about, journal about, maybe read some more scripture, maybe uh, pause and pray. But have you ever personally witnessed a modern miracle or heard of, of the story of one? What does that miracle reveal about the character of our God? And second, what miracle do you think you would most like God to, to, God to perform today? Why? And then I'd, I'd love for you just to think about that miracle and then pray for it. Um, pray in faith that God might do something miraculous and see, um, see him work. Um, I think that's a great question for us to reflect on. What miracles do we think need to happen? And then let's pray in that direction. And let's believe that God can do those miracles that we ask, if we ask according to his will and in abiding in him. Well, thanks for joining me, and I hope that this was spiritually edifying and nourishing, and I hope to see you back here next week for the next chapter of Second Kings. God bless. <laughs>